Welcome, everybody. My name is Timo Ferlin. Um, I'm from Vendip Capital. Capital. We're an early stage pre-series A fund hailing from Helsinki. Um, and we invest purely in, in SaaS companies in the Nordics and Baltics, and, and primarily into companies that uh, have traction already coming from a large international market. Uh, we take a very hands-on role in helping companies to grow from uh, from uh, the, the pre-Series A stage all the way to the Series A, where we're then able to attract some top-tier fund uh, to, to join them on the ride. And that's the goal for, for all of the companies that we invest into. And uh, speaking of, of, of a top-tier fund, uh, we also have uh, Ox VC here joining us. We're ha happy to have them uh, partner, us, uh, partner with us on the session an excellent B2B SaaS specialist fund hailing from uh, London, actually. So Bob, can you tell a few words about yourself? Very happy to, thanks Timo. Uh, as a bit of background on me, uh, my name is Bob Thomas. I'm a principal in the Ox investment team. I'm actually personally based out of Stockholm, uh, where, where Frederick is based as well, and where my focus is to identify and partner with the most promising Nordic scale-up companies and work with them to accelerate to global scale. Uh, so as you say, at Ox, we invest in B2B SaaS businesses in the Nordics and across the EU. Uh, and with that market focus in mind, we, we have a lot of overlap with, with Vendap and your portfolio and some of the founders and operators in the audience today. Um, and I guess that's, that's probably all that anyone wants to hear from the investors. Or this is, this is the kind of least interesting part of the presentation. Uh, much more interesting to hear from Frederick Scanser, the CEO of Funnel, who's going to share his experience with the Funnel scale-up journey. As a tiny bit of context first, we were fortunate enough to partner with Frederick in the second half of 2018, uh, as Funnel was making its transition from a fast growing startup to a fast growing scale up. Uh, and as such, we've seen Frederick and his team overcome some go to market scaling challenges firsthand and have been constantly really impressed with the work that they do. Uh, one of the things that really impressed us early on was, uh, well, and continues to impress us frankly, uh, it is how systematic Frederick and his team are and how they engineer and then re-engineer the go-to-market model uh, to become both repeatable and predictable. And so with that in mind, uh, I think it's a really exciting case study for everyone attending the SaaS camp. I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, and I sense that a lot of the early stage SaaS entrepreneurs in the audience will uh, have a lot to take from this session. Uh, so we'll look forward to some Q&A at the end. But without any further ado, Frederick, over to you. Okay, all right. So I'm going to share my screen here and get into the presentation. Um, okay. Let's see, can everybody see this? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, so we we're going to talk about um, how to build a good go to market, how to build and continue to go build and refine and hone a good market model for, for SaaS companies. Um, and as, as way of background, um, uh, Funnel, we are a SaaS company, 100% recurring revenue. Um, we work with data, we work with marketing companies. Basically, marketing is becoming digital, measurable, and marketers need a platform to um, help them capture that data for analysis and reporting. And we, we provide that. We have over a thousand customers, um, 107 employees. Uh, based out of our Stockholm office and our, our Boston office in the U.S. Um, we started building Funnel in, in 2014, so we're, we're a bit over, over six years uh, into this, this journey. And um, while we're based out of Stockholm and started in Stockholm, we have 90% of our, our revenue outside of the Nordics. Um, so um, we have made the journey um, that that or, or a large part of the journey that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're not we're not there yet, but uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about there. But but uh, so and um, and we have we work with all types of customers. Um, uh, here is a, just a selection of the different sort of uh, categories that we work with, including SaaS companies, SaaS companies that want to measure how things go with their go to market, and basically have marketing and sales work together and hand over leads. Um, and we work including with, with some of the sort of top 10 uh, SaaS companies in the world. Um, yes, and so basically what, what I wanted to start off with is basically talk a little bit about the journey of a SaaS company and the steps that you can kind of, the concrete steps that you can look at uh, when you build your SaaS company. 
and and they are basically um, these steps, and these steps are sort of relatively well established. Um, actually, I would say, in my opinion, there is actually a, now that I'm getting into this and we're getting sort of past the scale up stage, um, there is a there is actually a fourth stage, <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll we'll come to that. Um, but we'll start here at the beginning. Um, so really, the first stage um, when you build your SaaS company is to find product market fit. And I think Mark Andreessen um, from, from Netscape very famously said, uh, you know, when you start, the only thing that matters is getting to product market fit. Um, and, and you know, then the question is, okay, well, when do I know <laughs> when I get to product market fit? Uh, and then he answers that question as well. He says, uh, basically, um, you, you can always feel it when it's happening. So <laughs> trust me, and that it actually turns out that's true. You know, it's kind of like you have a ball and you you, you drop it and, and nothing happens. And suddenly it starts to bounce a bit and then suddenly it really bounces. You, you're gonna feel it. Um, and um, so that's really the first goal. And I think sort of at this point that the, the team from Vendup want, wants you to call them um, and they'll be happy to <laughs> fund you. Um, and uh, once you've done that, once you have product market fit, so you've got a product that's got some bounds, um, then it's time to find a growth model. Most people work on these things at the same time. Um, and, that, and while you always need customers to pro find product market fit, you shouldn't try to really work too much on your growth model until you really have gotten further with the product. Um, so with the finding the growth model, um, you basically need to find a go-to-market model that really works. And an interesting thing here is that there isn't sort of a cookie cutter, exactly this is how you do it. Every product, every market, every team is different. And what works for you may be different from somebody else. Um, so you really got to find kind of what, what works for you. But there are a bunch of different sort of recipes and you can kind of try them and, and see which one that works. And then again here, I wanna, wanna since a lot of, lot of you listening are from the Nordics uh, or, or uh, adjacent sort of smaller markets, I wanna, wanna kind of make a, a specific point here as well that's a little bit special in this uh, for, for us. And that is, it is actually a lot easier to find uh, a go-to-market model that works in, for example, Sweden and, and Finland. Um, and but for the, for you to really pass, but but unlikely. I mean, there are some SaaS companies. Like in Sweden, we have Fort Knox, which is sort of a, a financial accounting company. They have a majority of their revenue in Sweden, and they have huge high market cap and are doing very well because they, they they are applicable for almost every business in Sweden. But if that's not you, if you really rely on sort of to, to get, become a big company, we really rely on, on sort of going reasonably global. Finding a growth model, you, you need to probably first find money that works in your country, and then but then you got to find one that works in a big market. It's probably enough if it works in the UK or, or in Germany or in the US. Um, it doesn't have to be more ambitious than that. But for example, just to take our example, doing outbound in Sweden isn't that hard. You know, you pick up the phone and you call somebody, the, the, you know, uh, the, they'll often answer the phone, pick up the phone and try to call somebody in the UK or in the US, likely or uh, uh, very low likelihood they're gonna answer the phone. So, you know, we actually had to rework our go-to-market mar model as we as we did this. So, so that, that's what I kind of would recommend here. Um, and then, so the question then is, okay, well, when, am I, when, I, when do I have my growth model? When am I ready to sort of go to the next stage, which is scale up, which is really what we want to do? Okay, well, you basically need to have some sort of repeatable process for getting customers. You need to have some sort of, you need to measure your go-to-market metrics and they need to sort of work. So it could be sort of payback time and LTV CAC ratio, so, something. It doesn't, they don't have to be perfect, but they kind of got a sort of work so that if you scale them, you're not going to sort of lose a huge amount of money. And then, and this is really important, and most people fool themselves here. If you have reasonable deal size and the founders sell, um, you, you're, and you don't count the salary of the founders or you can't <laughs> replicate having lots of founders, uh, you know, 
your 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 model probably doesn't scale. Um, so you got to kind of be able to hire, hire sales reps or do inbound at scale or do something that actually is scalable and that those metrics work. So if you do that, then you're in really good shape. And that's probably around the time that Ox wants you to call them <laughs> and they'll give you more money so you can scale up. Um, and um, and then you'd basically do more of what works and it starts to shift from sort of really like market risk and can we do this and is there a market for this and can we find a customer for this to like execution and that's a very different skill set so you might want to hire some people who are good at execution um, good at building a sales team good at scaling up marketing sales operations is super important measuring data um, and a really important thing here is if in your growth model, you found one thing that works, whatever it is that you can scale, that is enough. You only really need one reasonably large scalable channel to go to market. You don't have to have three or four channels that work or work on three or four. It's probably better to just double down on that one thing that works and really start scaling and building out processes and structure and measure and build, you know, and over time your brand will build. So that's really what I would recommend here. Um, and then you will start scaling and you will go into the scale up phase and you will grow usually pretty rapidly. And it's pretty interesting time because you may go from like 20, 30 employees to 70, 80, 90, and you'll find that a lot of your internal processes will break and you'll need a new office and a lot of things will happen, but it's really a great feeling. Um, and usually we say, that's it. And, you know, see you at hundred million dollars and, and, um, and you're unstoppable and you're, you're going to IPO, but we've actually learned that that's not the case. What actually quite often happens with companies, with SaaS companies that grow really well from a million dollar in annualized revenue up to sort of $10 million, $20 million, that growth starts to stall. It starts to peter off. And it's usually often because you had that one growth engine, that one channel that really worked and you double down on it and triple down on it and it really worked. And then it, it could just only take you that far. So really what you want to do is, and ideally before this happened, you want to be prepared. Um, and this is kind of a stage where we are now is you want to, you want to be prepared for this and you want to actually start to diversify your lead sources um, so that you can go really big and you want to re-engineer your go-to-market model so you've got a lot of different lead sources that work um, and and you may also have a number of different geographies that work so you know maybe you had one con large country before maybe you had europe before well, this is a good time to add the US, maybe add Asia. Uh, so you really kind of have both your graphic uh, spread and spread on your, on your lead sources. And if you do that and you do that well, then you can kind of power through this 10, $20 million ARR band. And then things I think really start to take off and, and you, you'll do incredibly well. Um, so those really are the steps that that we are seeing in uh, in building a, a SaaS business. Um, so if we go to the first one here um, and talk about that growth model, uh, how do you find uh, a growth model? Well, um, the first thing that's really important is, and, and I think we have a lot of learning uh, about uh, from, from sort of the early days of SaaS and software sales is the importance of separating lead generation and sales. And I think this really is an evolution. It used to be, you know, software sales were all high ticket items uh, and, it, you know, it was field sales people out there selling. Um, and then, you know, Dropbox um, and Zendesk came along and it was sort of, you know, free, free trial and signups and, and, and a huge amount of sort of volume and lots of predictability and analytics and people loved it, um, but actually the deals was quite small and it was hard to kind of get too big. And then a sort of a hybrid of this emerged, which was the pre predictability of the high volume and analytical pieces of the sort of freemium uh, model 
with the higher deal sizes. And so, so basically separating out lead generation, having separate KPIs and targets for lead generation, having a separate team uh, doing that, and having lots of measure points from first contact with a prospect until you start speaking to them and taking them through a sales cycle, marketing hands over leads to uh, sales, and then you keep tracking it and, and trying to get um, different teams to focus on different targets and continuously working them, you know, you'll make sure that you continuously have a, a good set of fresh leads every month to work on for the sales team and you're continuously closing deals. Um, and that, that I would really, really recommend if you're not doing it to do. And if you do it, you know, continue to refine it. Um, and, and really it is leads that drives a SaaS business. If you want to increase your revenue growth by 30% more than last year, you probably need 30% more leads. If you have a plan that says you don't need 30% more leads and you don't have a higher selling price, it's unlikely it's gonna happen. And then the flip side is if you generate more leads, sales gonna follow. Um, so that's the first step. Um, and then in terms of growth strategies, I talked about this, that every business is different. And what's going to work for you is a combination of, you know, basically a number of different factors. Um, for some inbound, it's going to work. Uh, and inbound uh, could be things like, you know, digital advertising, content marketing, SEO, PR, product-led growth. Um, you could do outbound. Um, be it email, phone, um, and and these are very different. Inbound is you you throw you, you're throwing a wide net and and you can't really pick who's coming to your web uh, that much. Uh, whereas outbound, you know you 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 can really target the individual person you want to speak to. Um, so the very very different strategies. And then there's the third one, which is which is partners. Um, uh, so you know basically letting others do the work. Um, uh, which of course sounds incredibly <laughs> good, but it's a hard thing to pull off and it, there is a right time for it. And, and, and sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not right. And you have different types of partners, you have technology partners, you have channel partners and so on. Um, and the question is, okay, well, how should I think about this? So when, you know, here's my business, what should I do? Uh, well, you should probably try different things, but here are some thoughts. So, I, I like to think about it in terms of these four, um, four uh, basically dimensions. So the first one is, is um, around deal size. Um, and um, when you're primarily inbound, it tends to be, you often have a slightly smaller uh, deal size um, because you're, you're, you're casting a really wide net and by default, most of your leads that are gonna come in are gonna be really small cus customers. And if you've got a really big deal size, you know, out of like 100,000 people that come to your web, you might only wanna to talk to four, unlikely it's gonna be economical. It's better to just call these four people. Um, and your geographic ma market needs to be large, right? If you, uh, if you wanna target, you know, customers in Dusseldorf in Germany, inbounds unlikely to be good because you're going to be targeting <laughs> you're not going to be able to target them that well um, uh, germany might be the smallest sort of uh, target market you can have with inbound um, I, i'd even say sweden is too small for it for example or finland um, and your target segment should also probably be you know be, be slightly wide if you if you have a very specific role you know i want to speak to like uh, you know, the legal person in mid-sized SaaS companies, again, it's quite a niche niche uh, uh, person to reach. Whereas, whereas, you know, if you want to talk to marketing people, that's a pretty wide uh, uh, target. And then, and then finally, the buyer, who's the buyer? Um, and the decision maker, who, would, who, who, are you, who are you pitching to? So inbound, most likely are going to come people who actually want to use the pro they've got a problem and they <laughs> they want to they want software to solve the problem and they want to buy it with a small deal size um if you if you want to target c-level people executives at, a, at, a, at your customers and do sort of a strategic you know 
top-down sale, unlikely that those are the ones that are going to come initially to your website. And then on the and, and these really are requirements, unless you've got a you know smaller mid-size, deal size, big geographic market, wide target segment, and end, and and the end users are going to be your buyers. I think it's actually unlikely you're going to get inbound to work well. Um, on the outbound side, I think you actually need a, a reasonable deal size, uh, and 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 what that deal size is depends on who you're trying to target. Uh, so for us, we say, we think we like to think of it as at least twenty thousand dollars per year on annual contract value. Uh, you know, we we reach marketing organizations in sort of e-commerce companies, SaaS companies, um, and um, you know they're not, they're not that eager to, to pick up the phone and, and talk to yet one other marketing solution. There are like 5,000 out there or 7,000. So, uh, so we, you know, we need to do a pretty big sale once, you know, so it's hard to get hold of people and, and sort of, it's a longer process. If you're speaking to some role that actually nobody calls and they're quite happy to pick up your phone and it's pretty easy to make a decision, you know, I, I, you can get down to much smaller values, and and likewise, some people actually want to see you know more more than this. So, it depends. Uh, you can here target a small geographic market. You can go worldwide with 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 outbound as well. But you have the opportunity. So it's actually this is a requirement, the deal size. But these others are opportunities. This is actually a, where where it's particularly good to use outbound is if you have a small geographic market, you want to target a narrow segment of roles. And you want to sell to executives, which are you know relatively few people in these companies. So that's a good way to think about this. Um, and then you know, the final channel we talked about was partners. Um, so then the question is, okay, well, when do I do partners? And the answer is, you do partners when and if it works. <laughs> and um, it's often hard to start with partnerships because nobody knows you, nobody knows your product. You've got to kind of create your market yourself. Um, but sometimes it's a requirement, you know, sometimes you, you have to go through, through other companies to sell. Like if you're selling software into telecom companies, like a, you know, Vodafone or a Verizon or a T-Mobile, they, they, they may not, you know, you might have to go through a system integrator that has a trusted relationship. Otherwise they're not going to let you install anything in their network. Um, and often a few partners represent the majority of the partner revenue. So focus on those, uh, finding those. And, and there are some examples of SaaS businesses whose growth story is really due to, to a few partners. I, it tends to happen. I mean, basically partners tend, you tend to do well. It's, I mean, you, you can go out and you can do business development. You can sign deals with, you know, even with large companies and partnerships. And then you sit back and absolutely nothing happens. I mean, I, I think the trick often is that if you can help their salespeople close deals faster or at higher, higher um, contract value or, or win more deals, then their salespeople are, are, are going to start talking about you and introduce you to deals. And it's just going to happen naturally. Um, so that's sort of where you want to get to. But it's not that easy always to do that. And again, um, Quickly, Frederick, if I can butt in, I'd like to ask like uh, about your story as such. Oh, my focus is off here. But um, so in terms of uh, go to market motions, how did you build your uh, your model at, at Funnel? And, and did you immediately go into outbound or how, did you try out some inbound models or, or partnership models that uh, initially or did you find did you somehow mix and match match these these uh, different strategies here? Yeah, we tried, um, we, we tried uh, a lot of these and we actually even went back and forth. Um, and I, so as, as, as I said, initially we, we did outbound, we did outbound locally in the Nordics, uh, worked quite well. We tried to scale that outside before we were well known and with a relatively small deal size and it didn't work well at all. And then we, we switched and relied on inbound. Um, and inbound allowed us to scale first across Europe and then we started to get a lot of inbound requests from the US quite early on in the company. And, and uh, then we decided it was hard to get the sales teams to work uh, because the inbound requests came in, but we still had an inside sales team who took over the, the leads and it was hard to get them to work the, the US hours uh, out of Europe. So my, my co-founder moved over to the US and set up uh, 
the office there in Boston, and uh, and we started to to build our our revenue base there relatively quickly, um, and it actually turned out to be really good. That's a really good benefit of inbound is that if you can get inbound to work in Europe, it's usually quite easy to scale it to other geographies. And it the the I would say the largest challenge with entering a new geography is to get leads, and if you can get them sort of uh, almost automatically or, or by just sort of scaling your existing process uh, without any risk or having to employ people for lead generation locally, then, you know, you just put salespeople in the new geography, you turn on the leads and actually sales really start to, to accelerate. And, and so we, we pretty quickly got up to U.S. representing about 40% of our business, uh, which is where, where it is today. And, and um, it's relatively high for being a European head up, headquartered uh, company. Yeah, thanks. That that makes a lot of sense, and and sort of employing a lot of these, uh, or or many of these strategies that you mentioned, uh, I think it makes sense for for many many sauce companies. But it is like you mentioned. I mean, you you need to try out things <laughs> to to actually figure out what works, and uh, and what works at at some stage might not work in another. So so it's a constant development, as I've understood. Yes, and don't give up you got to try it and then try it more and try even more like it, you know it, you, you really like if it comes to for example doing digital advertising for lead generation you gotta you gotta get good at it so it takes some time to to try these things good okay uh, so that's partners um and then as i mentioned you know once you find one of these focus on it and get really good at it because most likely it's a better return on investment to continue to scaling what what you found working rather than keep trying to find a bunch of other methods to work on initially uh, initially and then you build up this sales process and sales machine sales and marketing machine with measurable metrics and this is one example of sort of how you can do that this is an inbound example and um, where you really, really want to kind of um, start at the, at the prospect level or at the, you know, really at the top of the funnel and then go all the way to sign contracts. And you want to have a set of, of measurements and KPIs across this. And you want to measure them sort of every week or every month. Um, and so, for example, here it starts on the web with signups. The web books meetings for the sales team. So there's book meetings. Um, they result in the sales team talking to customers. Not all customers are good fit. The ones they talk to and deliver a demo, that's a good sort of probably sales qualified lead. So a book meeting might be a market qualified lead. A, a, a demo delivered might be a sales qualified lead. They may go then into a trial. Um, and a certain number of the trial customers may may uh, then end up becoming customers. You really want to measure this sort of on a real time basis. Um, and and as an example, this this is you know the, if you deploy funnel, um, funnel will pull the data from all your your lead generation sources. It'll pull data from your web. It'll pull data from your CRM system, from your payment system. It'll allow you to put all these things together and have, have this reported in, in real time. Uh, and, and it may look something like this. Um, so where you can track, this is a cumulative uh, graph of number of signups per month. You can compare it in the, this month in dark blue with, light, with last month in light blue. You even have a dotted line here that forecasts where you're going to end up. Um, if you come to this level of measurement and granularity, you you are able to forecast and and operate your business um, at a very high level of precision, um, and and that is that is very um, that that is very a very big competitive advantage. So I, I think this is what the objective should be at. And and then to do that, of course, you need to have a certain volume of sales. You need to be at like 20, 30 sales per month to, to get to this uh, level of, to have enough data and statistics. If it's just one or two deals a month, it's, it's too lumpy. Um, and um, this is 
a different measure and this is what you can achieve if you really have a, a, a well-oiled well sales uh, and marketing machine. Um, this is basically looking at sales rep and how much new revenue they close every month. And it's a cumulative plot. Um, so it's a cumulative plot of the num for each salesperson from like first day of joining how they're building their sort of book of business uh, actually includes um, um, some churns as well. Um, so, and, and, um, and it basically shows here that there's a very large consistency between the different, I mean, you basically have 15 salespeople here and the difference between the best performer and the, the so let's say a lowest performer is actually not that large. And that, that's an indication that you've got a very repeatable process where you're feeding your sales team with a sufficient number of leads um, that they can go take further and close. Uh, and then statistically it sort of averages out and they, they actually are all, all performing. Um, and this is data from our, our early days uh, of funnels. So it's real data and, um, and, and not a single salesperson failed, uh, which I think is, is highly unusual, but you can hire very sort of product focused salespeople uh, with, with analytical skills one, once you deliver sort of predictable leads to them. Um, so that, that's working very well. That I wanted to provide one sort of comment and note on um, sales metrics. Um, cause this is something that I, I was struggling a little bit with as we built our, uh, go to market model. Um, so I wanted to share some, some insights that I feel I gained here. Um, and, um, so basically, um, two quite important customer acquisition metrics. And I think the, the two that we, from, from sort of a new business perspective that we put the most of weight on or have put the most weight on are, are payback time and LTV CAC ratio. So payback time is basically um, your, um, it, it's, it's basically your, um, how much a customer pays you divided by how much it costs to acquire the customer. Um, and that basically then tells you, uh, you know, how many months it takes for them. How much do they pay you every month? And how much did it cost to acquire the customer? And then how much do they pay every month? Uh, so say it costs uh, $10,000 to acquire the customer and they pay you $1,000 per month. Well, then in, in 10 months, they're going to have paid back uh, themselves. Now, it isn't quite like that because actually, uh, you know, you might have a, a only 8% gross margin. So then it takes a bit longer, um, but sort of that. And then LTV CAC ratio is lifetime value over customer acquisition costs. So basically, how, again, you have to put in the gross margin, but how many times are customers? If, so basically, if a customer pays you back over in, in a year um, and, and, and basically they stay five years, uh, then you, know, you, you pay you back five times over. And for payback time, it's generally considered good to have 12 to 18 months uh, of payback time for LTV CAC ratio is generally in SaaS considered that three to five is a good. Um, and, uh, you know, I was um, pulling my hair over this because we had a earlier days, we were quite small deal size at the time. We had a really good payback time. I mean, it was like nine months, you know, it was stellar and super happy about it, but we, but the LTV CAC ratio just wasn't very good. We were struggling to get to three. I was pulling my hair uh, over it and I couldn't understand it. And what, what conclusion I came to and sort of bouncing this back to other, other founders who have a diff different deal size and different sort of focuses is it tends to be that if you have a small deal size, you typically do have, like we had a, a, a really good payback time um, uh, because you have a really low cost of acquiring customers. Um, but those customers come and go, so your churn is quite high and therefore you, you, you don't get your LTV up and therefore your, your LTV CAC ratio isn't that good. Um, and then on the flip side with enterprise companies, um, you tend to have a long payback period um, because it's actually quite costly to have salespeople, enterprise salespeople are really expensive. And, um, 
and you have long sale cycles. But once they sign, you know, an enterprise doesn't do much in five, in three to five years. I mean, they, they, they're unlikely to churn and therefore your LTV CAC ratio becomes quite high. So in, a, in an enterprise sales, you, you should have, I, I actually think you should have a LTV CAC ratio much higher than five. Um, and similarly, in, a, in sort of a very quick transactional inbound model, you should have a much lower payback period. Um, and this is what happened to us as we as we went up market. Our our payback period actually got a bit longer, and our LTV CAC ratio, you know, got up all the way to five and above five. And, and we were doing incredibly well on these SaaS metrics. But it but it took a while to get there. And it's helpful to know this and know what you should be aiming for. And I think in the end, the most important thing is to measure these and have a system in place for measuring them, and then keep getting a little bit better every day or every month or every year and then you will do well. Um, and then the final thing I, I would say is to do, don't forget the net promoter score or some other sort of measure of customer satisfaction. And don't just, just focus on building a sales machine. You need a good product and a good customer experience as well. Um, so just wanted to sort of throw that in there. Um, There's a quick question on the q and I think might be relevant. I mean, uh, in the early stage, did you guys somehow, or how did you estimate the LTV? Or did you have some difficulties in doing that? Because Quite often, companies have issues with, with, you know, understanding how long the customer will stay if they don't really have much churn in the early, early stages when they're just bringing in their first customers. And so, did you do it at all in the early stage, or, or did you have to wait for for some customers to actually churn? And 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 how did you actually calculate it? I don't mean to go into the technicalities here. Yeah, but so it's a great question. So so I would say so we had a we had a small deal size. Um, we had a lot of you know relatively large large number of customers. Uh, we had monthly contracts. So, you know, every month customers were churning. And uh, so it felt like we pretty quickly got, got a good measure of the, what the churn was. Um, if you got enterprise, more, more, more higher deal sizes, if you sign sort of annual agreements, uh, you know, for the first 12 months, nothing's gonna happen. I totally understand that. But then, you know, once you start having your contracts turn over, I think you'll pretty quickly get a get a feel for what your renewal rate is. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, you you with all these things. I mean, there's no no point in doing metrics if you've got ten customers. You you got to get up to a number of customers, hundred or something, before you're gonna you, you got to really see this. Um, and um, but but if but if if you have so little churn that it's hard to measure, it's probably an indication that you're doing reasonably well on that side, uh, I would say. Um, yeah. we, we originally didn't have that problem. <laughs> we, uh, it was easy to sign up and easy to leave, but but churn now for us is, is very different as we moved up market and as the products got more mature now, now it's a very low figure. Very good, thanks. Cool, cool. So growth strategies. Um, So, so basically, we talked about um, we talked about getting product market fit, finding a growth model, and then starting to scale up. And then once you've scaled up, and and that's working, then start to think about sort of going really big. And and to go really big, it's actually then time to diversify, uh, both in terms of um, the lead sources you have and the geographies you have. And I, and I think this sort of this matrix here might be helpful. So you, um, um, you know, you could do, I mean, at the top, you could be, you could say inbound, outbound and partners. I, I, I sort of broke it into content marketing, advertising, outbound and partners here. Um, and then you've got uh, three, three regions, um, US, Europe and Asia. And the, ni the nice thing here is if you start to work on content, worldwide, start working on advertising worldwide, start working on outbound different regions, starting getting partners involved in different regions. You don't have to have all, it, basically it's 12 different, you, you've got 12 different cylinders and not all of them have to sort of be at the, at the absolutely, you know, hitting it out of the ballpark or meeting, meeting plan. If you've got a number of these working, then then you're in pretty good shape and they can play play off each other. And specifically if you, if one region starts to become really difficult competitively or one of your um, 
lead generation sources starts stops to work either globally or in one region it, it, it's okay you can you can rely on the others so um, that you know and it, it doesn't have to be these it's whatever works for you uh, and whatever regions work for you but that's really what what I would kind of recommend um, so to sum it up um, you know don't start to work too much on on the go to market model until you you, you you got product market fit don't start to scale up your go to market model until you've got a some sort of repeatable processes in your go to market model um, and and that can be scaled uh, and do put in place a system to follow up on all important metrics um, i really um, I'd really recommend here. I mean, I, I think that, you know, in SaaS, the, the, the holy grail is really to get marketing and sales to work together. And marketing should not be a brand marketing or marketing communications. Marketing in this world with marketing, you know, being so digital and measurable, marketing should be accountable for leads. Um, and then whether you put outbound so sales development reps or business development reps in in marketing or not but they they should be really accountable for measuring leads and handing over leads you can also of course have the product through product-led growth generate product um, qualified leads but but you know marketing should be reportable for that and then sales should receive those it should be a repeatable motion that you measure um, and if you do that and get that system right uh, you know your market model is going to be pretty powerful um, and then, and then, you know, when you get really big, start worrying about adding more lead sources. Good. So that's my presentation. And I think now I'd be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Frederick. We've, uh, we've got some great questions in the chat. Uh, a, a couple of kind of clarifications first uh, on, on the kind of cumulative salesperson performance charts. Uh, was was that kind of ARR sold per sales rep? That was a question from Morton Paulson. Yeah, yeah, it was it was MRR per month. So cumulatively, how much new MRR did each salesperson add every month? But actually, also how much did they lose due to churn? So so it was really their their all their cumulatively customers. But, and 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 how much do they go up through up sales as well? So really, how did they book a business evolve over time? Awesome. I think it's. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and ask you a kind of difficult question, um, which is you've mentioned kind of going through a number of phases of of kind of reworking and re-engineering the model, uh, and then at the same time in the early stages focusing on what you're good at and getting really good at it. And there's a kind of natural tension between those two things, the kind of focus and then also the diversification. How do you, when you're thinking about building a team and developing a team, kind of think about the tension between those two different things? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, I mean, it, so different lead generation strategies are gonna, are gonna have completely different requirements on marketing, of course. If you're going to scale up digital advertising then you know that's what you need specialists in if you don't do content marketing and you know so so you got to hire those specialists and you're going to kind of trust that they, they're going to d deliver and, and then it's just a matter of how big you you scale those teams and then when you go into sales it's a bit of the same um you've got to be a little careful um both when you hire sales reps and when you hire senior sales sales managers and sales leaders um because they tend to have either worked inbound or outbound. And actually those are very different. If you're used to inbound leads, like literally, you know, you, you, uh, you know, a, a meeting is booked for you. You get on a video call and you ask, how can I help you? Right. If you, if you get on a, on a outbound call, call that a sales development rep has worked really hard on working on, you know, you, you don't get on the call and say, how can I help you? Go on the call and say, I'm so grateful for your time. I'm going to be very quick. I'm going to tell you how I can change your world, you know, uh, and, and it's a very different mentality, right? So those are two things. And then also deal size, right? So, you know, if you, I mean, if you're selling something for $500 per month, MRR, that's highly transactional sales and quick, not strategic business user, you know, um, if you're going to sell something at five, five thousand dollars you know you're used to mapping out the organization and if there's some stuff that 
they need done, the product doesn't do, then probably the company is going to sort it out and you need some resources. And you're pretty good at actually rallying resources to sort of get something custom built for if it's a $10,000, $15,000 MRR customer. And if you get a sales rep like that, that has a $1,000 deal and then tries to do the same in a product, more product-led company, is going to be a lot of tension because that's not how it operates. We've got a roadmap and we, you know, we're never ever listened to one single customer before, right? So, so and, and, but more importantly, they're just not gonna be happy and they're not gonna do well uh, if, at a different. So, so you, you gotta probably have a higher at the ARR where you are. If you wanna try a different strategy, go up market, hire one or two reps, try it. You might be really disappointed for a long time. Eventually you probably will get there. <laughs> There's uh, another good question here from Tim Yeppesen who has asked, uh, how do you think about buyer personas and buyer journeys? And, and I guess specifically in relation to, to your, you know, your, your journey with Funnel as you've moved up market, uh, have, you seen, have you seen that change? Yes, we have seen it change. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's usually important. Um, so, I mean, you got to figure it, and also different if you do outbound or inbound. Um, I mean, we, we did inbound and then it's actually a matter of like whoever comes to your website, comes to your website, sort of, and you got to figure out who they are. Um, for us, it changed a lot. In the early days, it was marketers came to our website and then larger companies started to come to our website. And then actually it was more technical people in the organizations who had been tasked by marketing to sort this problem out who came. And then actually we had to sort of change our positioning a bit. And, and what, what, was it, what was it that drove that change? Was that your kind of influence on, on the marketing messages that, that you were putting out there? Or, or was that just an underlying change in the market, the, the people who are using these tools? Yeah, I think for us, it was both. Uh, so it was actually us moving a bit more up market with our message and, um, and then getting into organizations that were larger that then had these resources, but also initially it was like this stuff didn't exist so mar but our marketers when they saw an ad they were like wow <laughs> just true i want it and then they just went and they could actually buy it and then you know didn't talk to anybody else in their organization just bought it um whereas now it's more established you can solve this problem so then the organization is creating a project having stakeholders across the business and then different people go out and look for it so uh, mar market maturity as well we have a couple of different questions here relating to kind of lead quality scoring, which I'm going to try and combine into one. So I'm going to try and combine the question from Zachary and from Natalia, which is at an early stage, you know, it can be quite cha challenging to uh, predict the quality of the leads that you're looking at as you're building that machine. H how do you think about kind of building in lead scoring as the business matures? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You got to be really careful. Like we had an example really, really early on when we were like almost like free trial kind of low price point and then advertising globally for our product. And, you know, the, the marketing team just sort of optimizing for number of signups. And then I, I, I observed that we got a lot of signups from Indonesia and Philippines and like, you know, and, and it was just super high, low quality leads and and we were optimizing completely the wrong things so i, I think it's a you it, it's a it's a it's a really it's a really good question i think it is um so i'd consider putting a person in charge of looking at the leads actually what i ended up doing was sitting with the team and every day we pulled up you know we use hubspot for crm we pulled up the report of okay 40 leads today. It's not that many, 40. You can look at 40 in HubSpot and HubSpot will tell you the company, it'll tell you uh, email address, role. And we went through them and we said, good, bad, good, bad, maybe, maybe, you know. And then, and then you know, the team starts to go, ah, I get it. That's that campaign didn't work. That really worked. You, you, that's the level of granularity you got to get to so, to really understand it. And what, what were the types of things that you were kind of thinking about when you went good, bad? I mean, I guess there's ge geographic fit and your ability to serve those customers, which you've mentioned, were there, were there other factors that were at play? Yeah, do they sign up with a, with a company email or, or is it a Gmail? Um, you, you probably want to maybe ask a little bit of information, like give, give your website of your company uh, if they do that. And then, and then you can quickly see how many employees do they have. Do they have 20 employees? 
200, 2000, and, and, and then what type of a customer? What kind of a company is it? You know, we originally targeted mostly e-commerce companies. If it was an e-commerce company, we were pretty sure we were going to close it. If it was, uh, you know, some some big industrial company, it felt un very unlikely. Um, uh, it, it probably won't surprise you to know that we've had the inevitable COVID question asked. Uh, you know, we're we're kind of post-COVID now. In in Niels's question, at least, uh, how. How did that look kind of for Funnel going through COVID and, and what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs maybe at an earlier stage for, for how, to, how to kind of build their business for this kind of new normal? Yeah, so COVID uh, affected us and affected us at least as much as the average SaaS business, maybe maybe a bit more. We, we do data, which wasn't sort of affected, but more, our customer was marketing and mar marketing budgets are cut like, very quickly they're very fast to adopt so so you know our, our growth still grew but it went went down to sort of relatively small digits for a while for like six months um and and we we, we were lucky to be well funded and and had faith that this would come back um and so you know we we kind of stuck with it um and, and just scaled back a little bit on on we, we didn't hire anything um so, you know, this is my, the third recession that I go through. Um, and um, I think my learning is like, we were super fast. The minute we, we started to see things slide, we, we, we stopped all hiring and, and, and the team was really surprised. Like, well, you know, we had, we had more than doubled our, both our revenue and our size the year before. Uh, and, as, and as we were used to like hiring, hi, really, I mean, hiring was important. And then suddenly, like, you know, people were at offer level stage and we just said, no, no, no. Um, so I think you got to act really, really quickly and you got to act reasonably decisively based on what your cash situation is, because if you don't, you know, you it's really hard to recover. Um, um, and then the flip side is you got to be prepared for when it comes back. Right. Uh, I, I don't think it's fully come back yet. It, it actually is. Is still. I, I don't think we're post COVID. Actually, I, I think it's still a bit depressed. I, th I think we'll we'll find in Q two it comes back, but who knows? <laughs> I, that's what I think, and I, I actually think it could come back pretty strongly. Um, normally, when pandemics end, when wars end, uh, there's a lot of spend that's up pent demand and, and euphoria, and I, I think we can see a pretty buoyant uh, back half of 2021. Yeah, but I, I, have, I have been wrong before. I think uh, the, even the kind of Swedish perspective, even in the context of the Nordics, it's sometimes kind of difficult to know when we're kind of mid-COVID, post-COVID uh, in relation to other people. Uh, a really good question here, which unfortunately is anonymous, uh, so I, I can't tell you who asked it, but um, it's in relation to expanding into new geographies. Obviously, this, this took place kind of pre-pandemic. Um, how did you scale and serve different markets from Sweden directly? Did, did you import... Uh, other nationalities into the Swedish market and, and sell from Sweden, uh, or, or did you kind of move into other geographies directly? And, and if so, how did you kind of score those? Yeah, so we we consider Europe one geography, and we do all of Europe from Sweden, and we do it through inside sales. Um, I think as a first premise, we've said that we you know we use English, and uh, and uh, and and uh, if so, we don't do native languages. Um, we, we've started now as we've gotten larger. To build up some native language capability in the in the larger kind, you know, um, languages like German, French, uh, Spanish, and Italian, um, but we have not translated our site. We have not translated our 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 um, our product. I think there is a big opportunity to do that. You can probably get a twenty percent pop in your lead gen by doing that, um, but it carries with it a huge cost uh, because you got to translate your website, your app uh, you got to have you know your business development reps speak that language your sales reps your customer success reps and you got to support in that language and then whenever you make a change you got to do it in you know five languages so you know that's a big tax to carry with you i i i'd, I'd wait until past 20 million dollars in arr to do that um, that's good advice there hey we're nearing the end of our session here i'll, I'll take one one more question it might be a little bit more specific but uh, Beatrice is is asking here, how do you budget for one SaaS salesperson per year? But but in general, I mean, how have you like looked at the 
especially early stage, how do you consider the OTs, the on-target earnings for the salespeople that you hire and, and sort of their commissions that you pay for them? How do you, where do you get the sense of what's, what's the right level for the salespeople to get compensated and, and what should they target in the early stage? I, I, so I, I think it's a really good question. I think it really depends on the number of leads you give them and, and the deal size. We work relatively small deal size early on, but, but relatively lead rich. So we, we had a target of around, well, we were, we, our salespeople early on were, were generating about $3,000 in MRR per sales rep. Um, and we ended up paying them um, the MRR they closed in bonus because they were pretty junior. And then, and then it sort of went up to, after a couple of years, they, it, an average salesperson closed $5,000 in MRR. Um, but that was, so, um, and then they were a bit more senior and they made more money. Um, and then actually we changed it and we said, we actually don't think bonuses are working very well and we removed sales bonuses. Um, so we actually don't pay any sales bonuses. It doesn't mean we pay our salespeople less. <laughs> they make their OT every, every, as a fixed salary every, every month. Um, and we did that because you saw how consistent our sales was. Um, you know, we didn't feel we, we didn't feel like it was making a big difference, but it really caused a lot of you know quibble between like who gets this lead, should it be a lead between this portion of that salesperson, or should it be in this region or that region? And and people were you know naturally focused on closing business and not helping each other. And now we have people sharing leads, people selling together, people handing over halfway through the lead process to somebody who's better at closing it, people jumping in, helping others to close and um, fantastic behavior from a sales team that's completely different and we're doing better than we, we've ever done before. So uh, we, we've gone a very different route. I, I'd really, <laughs> I, this is unusual. Most, most, sales, most sales companies don't do this. Almost everybody pays commission. We don't. Even in the US? Not, yes, even in the US. Yeah, that, that is unusual, let's say. Uh, yes, yes. And we have not had a single salesperson leave. Um, yeah. uh, and it, it, it's, um, I, I'd really recommend you think about this thing with bonus. When you, if you're early in the company, you can really think about this. You, you know, you, you have the luxury. Um, and uh, have a think about it, um, whether you need bonuses or not. It, it, we've taken it away. Nobody in our company has bonuses. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's that's all we have. We're a little bit over time even. Um, so so we'll, we'll have to wrap it up here. But thanks so much, Frederick. Uh, this was really useful. And I, I believe that all of the listeners got, got a lot from, from your uh, experience that really shown uh, from, from your presentation here. So thanks thanks so very much for coming here. And thank you, Ox. And thank you, Bob, for, for organizing this with us. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on board uh, every time. So... <laughs> So uh, really, really big thanks to you guys. And uh, we'll see you in the upcoming sessions. And, and best of luck, uh, Frederick, to your, to your um, future, let's say. Onwards and upwards, as they say. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Stephen.